Hey everybody, welcome to Song and Sword Online Church. We're so glad that you're with us again today. Go to songandsword.com to get this outline and get more information about the ministry. You can give your tithes and offerings there. We are a worldwide church that's online that happens to meet every Sunday at the Chateau at 9 and 1030. More and more people are uh, gathering with us. Uh, so we would invite you, if you're close to Central Illinois, come and join us at the Chateau. And uh, we'd love to share the Word of God with you. i got a great sermon today. How do I know it's great? Because as we've been saying in this Sword of Truth series, the Word of God is living, it's active, it's alive, and it, it abides. And uh, it's going to breathe into your life today. So um, I hope that you'll invite somebody to watch this. But we're glad to have you here on another Sunday. Would you grab some communion elements? I've just got some simple uh, white sandwich bread and a little grape juice uh, here to share. Get something, and at the end of this sermon, we'll, we'll take the body and blood of Jesus Christ together. Um, text prayer to that number on the screen. We'd love to pray with you, as always. And uh, if you need to contact us about anything, especially your walk with Jesus Christ, we're planning some baptisms for next Sunday, the 24th. And so um, if you are interested in being baptized at the Chateau, please let us know. Uh, we'd love to follow up with you on that. God bless you guys. Uh, Sarah and I are getting ready to head on vacation uh, today as soon as we're done preaching. And so I pray that you would uh, pray for us. It's very important for preachers to get away and relax. And it's been a long year. And I've preached a sermon every Sunday for a year. And now uh, I might get a little break from that. So God bless you guys. Thanks for being a part of the Song and Sword ministry. Well, one of the blessings of the last four years, and this last year, but actually four years ago, when COVID hit and everything was shut down, and then this last year of just turmoil and job loss and all the stuff that's happened in our lives, one of the blessings of that is that Sarah and I uh, have walked together more than ever. We've walked along several rivers by canals. We've walked on trails through woods. We've Walked on several beaches, praise God. That's where we're going to be this week, Lord willing. Most commonly, though, we walk every day uh, here in Bloomington uh, Normal. One of the hidden values and gems of our community is the Constitution Trail. And most days, if we're feeling healthy and the weather's not crazy, we walk about five miles a day. And, uh, of course, at our age, this is exercise. We're just trying to make sure the blood's still flowing, the heart's still beating, we can breathe, and our joints don't hurt too bad. But... Um, but going for a walk with someone that you know, like my best friend, my wife, Sarah, is a time for talking, for discussing, for catching up, for remembering, planning, dreaming, sometimes arguing about things. And we've had all those conversations and more. Sometimes you just walk along quietly. But more than anything else, going for a long walk with somebody that you love is conversational. And it's on a walk that we find in the Bible today in Luke chapter 24 uh, that's going to that's gonna form our sermon for us today. The walk is that of Cleopas and an unnamed friend heading from Jerusalem about seven miles from Jerusalem to a place called Emmaus. And the topic of conversation is Jesus. And, uh, and then they're talking and they're gabbing and they're doing what you do as friends walk on the trail. And all of a sudden, another traveler joins them and helps them make sense of their conversation. So I want to read this story. It's a little bit lengthy passage than uh, most uh, times we do, but listen to it because the story is fantastic. Luke chapter 24, verse 13. That very day, two of them were going to a village named Emmaus, about seven miles from Jerusalem. And they were talking with each other about all these things that had happened. And while they were talking and discussing together, Jesus himself drew near and went with them. But their eyes were kept from recognizing him. And he said to them, what is this conversation that you're holding with each other as you walk? And they stood still, looking sad. Then one of them named Cleopas answered, are you the only visitor in Jerusalem who does not know the things that have happened there in these days? And he said to them, what things? And they said to him, concerning Jesus of Nazareth, a man who was a prophet, mighty in deed and word before God and all the people, and how our chief priests and the rulers delivered him up to be condemned to death and, he, and crucified him. But we had hoped that he was the one to redeem Israel. Yes, and besides all this, it is now the third day since these things happened. Moreover, some of the women of our company amazed us. They were at the tomb early in the morning, and when they did not find his body, they came back saying that they had even seen a vision of angels who said that he was alive. Some of those who were with us went to the tomb and found that just as the women had said, but him they did not see. And he said to them, O oh, foolish ones, and slow of heart to believe all that the prophets have spoken. Was it not necessary that the Christ should suffer these things and enter into his glory? And beginning with Moses and all the prophets, he interpreted to them in the scriptures all the things concerning himself. 
So they drew near to the village to which they were going, and he acted as if he were going further. But they urged him strongly, saying, Stay with us, for it's toward evening, and the day is now far spent. So he went in to stay with them, and when he was at table with them, he took the bread, and he blessed it, and he broke it, and he gave it to them. And the eyes, and their eyes were opened, and they recognized him, and he vanished from their sight. And they said to each other, Did not our hearts burn within us while we talked, while he talked to us on the road, and while he opened to us the scriptures? Let's pray and ask the Lord to speak to us today. God, we serve uh, those of us who are, uh, believe in Jesus Christ and love him as our Lord and Savior. We serve a risen Jesus who's alive. And what we know now, these two on that road that day did not know. And, uh, and yet there's still more to learn about you as we travel along walking side by side. So Lord, we, we join you. Um, I invite uh, whoever's watching today into this journey from Jerusalem to Emmaus. I invite them to listen to what you have to say about yourself, to listen to the way you're, you have this conversation, and to enter into the conversation of this culture. God, I pray if there's someone that doesn't know you as Lord and Savior, that today would be the day, and you would grab them by the preaching and teaching of your holy word. God, give me power, not by eloquent words or wisdom, but by the power of the cross, death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus, power of his resurrection, and the power of the Holy Spirit. Come now, Lord Jesus, and speak to us. I ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Well, many of you have probably heard of uh, a program. There's actually a, a spiritual weekend retreat program called the Walk to Emmaus. It's a national organization. We have a very strong one here in Bloomington uh, Normal. And uh, many people that I know, maybe many of you, have been on this three-day retreat uh, that's called Walk to Emmaus because like this Walk to Emmaus in the Bible, it's designed to take a long walk with Jesus to invite him into the conversation of life and to get to understand him better and grow closer to him. And so um, I'm hoping that that's what's going to happen as we walk through this passage together. The first walk to Emmaus happened on the afternoon evening of the very first Easter Sunday, what we call Easter Resurrection Day. And Cleopas and his unknown friend are walking and talking. So if you have your outline there uh, on our website, uh, songandsword.com, the first point that I'm going to make here is discussions along the way about Jesus and the truth happen. Discussions along the way about Jesus. These two guys probably are headed home after a Passover week in Jerusalem. Remember, Passover was one of the main, if not the main major feast that every Jewish person made a trek to Jerusalem from all over the world every year to celebrate and, uh, and this was Passover was like no other. They, they had tons of people there, but what dominated the headlines in this Passover, what everybody was tweeting about, not tweeting about, I guess it's Xing now, uh, what everybody was posting, what everybody was taking selfies about, they were talking about this Passover specifically and Jesus Christ. And so were these guys. They're, they're walking and they're talking and they're conversing about Jesus. When Jesus asked them in verse 17, what is this conversation that you guys are having as you walk along the way. Um, they tell him, and so we know what they were talking about. If you go on to verse 19 through 20, they just kind of summarize what they've been talking about, and they're kind of surprised. I mean, Cleopas actually said, excuse me, sir, are you, where, have you been hiding under a rock somewhere? Have you been, you're the only person that's not been in Jerusalem and understood what's going on these days? And so um, we know what they were talking about because they kind of recap uh, this for Jesus as he comes into their conversation in verse 19. They say, first of all, Jesus of Nazareth, every, all the news headlines this week are about Jesus of Nazareth. We thought he was a prophet, mighty indeed. You see that? We, we thought that he was a prophet, mighty indeed, before God and all the people. We've seen him do miracles. We, we've seen him do healing. Blind people see and deaf people hear and Maybe they were there at the feeding of the miracle of the 5,000, the, the miracle feeding of the 5,000. We don't know, but these guys were walking and kind of reminiscing about this whole three-year journey with Jesus as prophet. We, he was a prophet, mighty indeed. He was also a prophet, they say in verse 19, mighty in, in word. He was a great teacher. He, the Bible says over and over again that Jesus taught as one who had authority, not as the regular teachers of the law. He preached the kingdom of God that had come. He boldly challenged the religious leaders and, and silenced them with his arguments from the Old Testament. In fact, these rulers were so challenged by Jesus that that led to what they're talking about, his crucifixion. They betrayed him and turned him over to the authorities. They delivered him up to be condemned and be put to death and crucified, is what it says here in verse 20. 
So they're talking about the events of Friday. They're talking about, man, did you see how bad he looked after the beating? Man, did you, did you hear the crowd chanting, crucify him, crucify him? Can you believe that Pilate didn't let him go, but he let Barabbas go? And, and uh, can you believe that it happened on Passover as the sun went down? And those, those chief priests, I'm sure they were just going back and forth. These guys had obviously known Jesus, were followers of his. They'd seen his teaching. They've, they've are seen his healing. They've heard his teaching. Maybe they'd been healed by him. But now they're reeling from this sudden turn of events where this guy that they thought was going to be the Messiah um, is dead. And these are the facts. These are the experiences that these two, they discussed as they walked. And now remember, we're maybe two or three o'clock in the afternoon. If, if it's a seven mile walk, let's give them, you know, let's give them a couple of three hours because they're walking slow. They're not walking for exercise. They're walking in sandals. It's dusty and it's, it's rocky. So let's give them three hours. And an hour into this, man, they are having a conversation. When Jesus asked the question for them in verse 17, what is this conversation you're having as you walk along the way? That word conversation is a really great Greek word. Ante balete literally means opposite throwing. It's the way you and I talk. It's the way you have conversations with your friends, even if you're texting your friends. But if you're in, if you're in a public setting or if you're face-to-face talking with somebody, we talk like this, this opposite throwing. They were having a conversation. I throw out a thought or a couple of statements and you throw one back and then I throw one back to you. Sometimes we can't wait to say what we want to say so we talk over each other. If you're in a family like the Baker family, you never complete a sentence because somebody's going to jump in and have their thought before. So you get this idea of ideas being thrown back and forth. So Cleopas and his friend, as they're walking, they go, well, what about this? But what about this? And here's another thing. And they're just they're talking it out. But there's more to this conversation because of two emotionally, spiritually charged realities. The first one is, we had hoped that he was the one. Look in verse 21. We had hoped he was the one to redeem Israel. They they thought he was the Christ. Jesus later references the Christ. Did not the Christ have to suffer these things to enter into his glory, verse 26. The Christ, remember, is Christos, anointed one. (coughs) Excuse me. Same word as Mashiach, Messiah in the Old Testament. The anointed king to come that was promised by God. We thought he was the one, but he can't be the one if he's dead. So they got that swirling around in their mind. But then there's another piece of news. Early that morning, some women of our company amazed us. They went to the tomb. They saw a vision. And the vision of the angel said, he is alive. Can it be? And so can you imagine adding into all the turmoil of, and, and all the knowledge of the last three years, and we thought he was the Messiah, but now he's dead, but maybe he's alive. This is the other word that, that we find here in this passage in verse 15. They're talking and discussing. You see that? Circle that if you want to in your Bibles. Discussing means the seeking of the truth. That's what this word means in the Greek. So they're discussing, going, what is true? And they're going back and forth, and they're reviewing events, and and they're, they're in some ways shocked. In some ways, they don't know what to do next. They, they thought they knew something about Jesus. They thought they knew some things about him, but they're going back and forth. They're maybe getting animated about it. So you put these two words together, they're having this throwing back and forth, and they're seeking the truth. It's like, it's like we do in our normal conversation. It's like sports fans discussing who's the greatest of all time, or the GOAT, as they abbreviate that now. Who's the greatest basketball player? Who's the greatest baseball player? You get a bunch of fans and they will tell you, where's the greatest place to go on a vacation? Or who's the better team, the Cubs or the Cards? And you will be bantering back and forth and making your point and making your stance or arguing uh, what the best fast food sandwich is. Of course, we all know it's filet of fish from McDonald's. That's the best fast food sandwich. But I digress. I can make a very good biblical point for fish being... um, Uh, the uh, sandwich of our Lord, even though Chick-fil-A makes a very strong case for the most holy sandwich, right? I hope you're laughing at home because I'm laughing inside. Maybe this time of year we can debate whether peeps are better than cream-filled eggs for Easter. Now these are very light-hearted discussions and disagreements and back and forth and trying to find the truth. In fact, you're never going to find the truth in those trivial matters, but these guys are having a very serious discussion about Jesus and truth. What is true about Jesus? Is it possible that he's alive? Is he really over everything, including death and the grave? 
because that would be pretty something. Or is this just some rumor that we've heard that he's alive? Some silly emotional women at the, at the tomb on an early morning, they had that kind of prejudice. They might have been saying that. But if he is not alive, then where's his body? What happened? Is he the son of God? Is he the living word as he said? Or just some other prophet and teacher? What exactly is Je Who is Jesus, I should say? Were we all just duped? And they go back and forth and back and forth. And Cleopas might have remembered, oh, remember he said he was going to be dead and buried on the third day raised again. And the other guys, I never heard him teach that. And, and, but he was so powerful. How could he not conquer death? But he did raise Lazarus. And they're going back and forth. They're reviewing, is Jesus the truth or not? What if Jesus were to drop in our conversations today? Our work conversation, the topic of our talk at school or home or our neighborhood. What if he went through our text messages through a day with those we socialize and those we call friends here near and far? What if he came and he asked like, like he asked these guys, what are you guys talking about? <laughs> I, I think I'd have to confess that most times I'm not talking about something as significant as the truth of Jesus. I'm talking about sports or politics or weather or plans that we've made, or the economy. And this is not the sermon, but just something for us to review. What conversation are you having that Jesus eavesdrop on? But I do believe there's a conversation in our culture that, that reminds me of this one on the road to Emmaus. I do believe the world has heard enough about Jesus, the world that most of us live in, know of him. They talk about him. They have doubts about his word, the Bible. They have doubts about his people, the church, perhaps. But there's a lot of spiritual discussion going on these days. Some accept him as one of the greatest teachers and philosophers of life, but that's it. Others think that he's, a, think that he's a, a fraud and he's blinded millions and he's not the real guy. And still others think he's one of many ways to God. Some want him just to be a loving, forgiving social reformer without standards of right and wrong. In other words, they want him to be Savior but not Lord. And into this conversation, into this conversation, Jesus still enters, like he did 2,000 years ago, our conversations and he enters into the most powerful way that changes every discussion we have along the way. And that's why it's so important, I think, for you to invite someone to be a part of Song and Sword for Easter or whatever church you're a part of. Because the resurrection story is the story. This is the thing that changes every walking, talking, debating, back and forth reality about the truth. When Jesus comes into the conversation about the truth, he brings something with him Easter spoiler alert, by the way, just in case you don't know and you don't remember, Jesus is not just a prophet or a teacher. He is, but he's the son of God. And he's not just a teacher of the law. He's the embodiment of grace and truth. And he is not dead. Here's the spoiler alert. Turn this off if you don't want to hear what's going to happen on Easter. He is alive, as the women reported. And as these guys finally conclude in verse 34, after he reveals himself to, to them, the Lord has risen indeed. He's alive. Now, if you've noticed through the series, uh, that brings us to the second point. Jesus is the living Word of God, or what we're calling the living truth, because we're, we're in this series about sword of truth. In fact, the last couple of weeks, you've noticed in this series, the Word of God is always alive and breathing. Hebrews 4.12, remember the Word of God is living and active. Last week, 1 Peter 1.23, the living and abiding Word of God. Jesus taught that that his written word, the scriptures, were all about him and life through him. John 5, 39 says this, you search the scriptures because you think that in them you have eternal life, and it is they that bear witness about me. In other words, Hebrews 4, 12 teaching, 1 Peter 1, 23 teaching, all point to Jesus Christ. If they're alive and active and alive and abiding, then Jesus cannot be dead. The writer of Hebrews writes it this way in Hebrews 11, 1 and 2. I love this. He gives us insight into who Jesus is as the living Word of God. Long ago, Hebrews says, at many times and in many ways, God spoke to our fathers by the prophets. But in these last days, He has spoken to us by His Son, whom He appointed the heir of all things and through whom He also created the world. John 1, 1 says, In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. John 1, 14 says, The Word became flesh and lived among us. Jesus Christ is the living Word of God. He could not remain in the grave if He's the Word of God, because the Word of God is always alive. And no one other than the risen and living Word of God uh, could approach this conversation the way Jesus does. He meets these two 
on the road to Emmaus when they're trying to figure it out. And he does something that we couldn't imagine. I don't know if you noticed in the story or not. <laughs> what, what I would expect of Jesus is to pop into that setting and just kind of be incognito, maybe walking behind them a little bit, maybe to one side, but you know, maybe his cloak pulled up over his head and, and not really saying very much. And then all of a sudden when they looked at him, just do a, a miraculous reveal. Hey guys, it's me, it's Jesus. I, I, I'm not dead, I'm alive. And, uh, but he doesn't. Instead, he keeps them from seeing him. I want you to see this. He keeps them in the dark for a little bit. It says that he kept them from knowing him uh, uh, because he wanted to, to prove a point. He wanted to make some teaching happen. Now, I want you to see this in the end of verse 17. They stood still looking sad. Verse 16, their eyes were kept from recognizing him. Why did they not recognize him? I think something miraculous was going on. Some people have a lot of different um, assumptions about this, but the reality is, is that Jesus kept his identity um, to himself for a minute so that he could teach them as they walk. So here they are in this sad state. And remember, they don't know. They, are, they are, still don't know that Jesus is alive. They're still going back and forth. And then some stranger just jumps into their conversation. And they might have been put off. They might have been saying, hey, dude, we're having a talk here about something really important. But he wants to prove to them that the Word of God is a living Word of God. So he goes to the written Word of God as his proof. And I love this. Jesus is the living Word of God. But Jesus is the living truth as an interpretation of Scripture. Instead of just jumping in and revealing himself to these guys, he teaches them that the law of Moses and the prophets, look, let me read it again. Beginning with Moses and all the prophets, he interpreted to, interpreted to them all the scriptures. He said in verse 26, foolish ones and slow of heart, isn't that all the prophets have spoken? Was it not necessary that Christ should suffer and then uh, enter into his glory? In other words, this is all in the Bible. The Old Testament Bible pointed to everything about the living word Jesus being dead, buried, and raised again. In the greatest teaching ever, Jesus interprets, I wish, you say about you wish there are conversations and things in the Bible that you could be a part of, I wish that I could be there in verse 27 where he interpreted to them. That's the Greek word hermeneuo, we get the word hermeneutics from it. You preachers out there, you know hermeneutics is a study for how to explain and expose the scriptures, make the scriptures come alive and un with understanding. And Jesus does this, the greatest preacher teacher of all time, literally gives himself as the living and true interpretation of all the Bible. He said this in the beginning of his sermon, but now they're listening in a different way because he's dead, he's in the grave. But in Matthew 5, verse 17, he said, do not think that I've come to abolish the law and the prophets. I've not come to abolish them, but to fulfill them. For truly I say to you, until heaven and earth passes away, not an iota, not a dot will pass from the law until everything is accomplished. And so maybe for an hour or so, Jesus is walking with these guys as they approach their hometown of Emmaus, and he is interpreting, he is opening up, explaining and expounding the word of the Old Testament about him, pointing to who he is. For Jesus, the Old Testament that sometimes we have take a back seat in our teaching from Genesis to Malachi, somewhere in there, right there, um, Jesus thinks is very important. In fact, every dotted I and cross T is what he literally says there. So in other words, Jesus is saying, you guys should be paying attention. You should be paying attention to the scriptures because the scriptures will be fulfilled to me. Every cross T, every dotted I. And for maybe an hour or two, Jesus gives them this incredible um, theological course. And he gives them in, in two ways. First of all, he says Jesus is the living truth as interpretation of Scripture. This is called typology in theology. Typology is that there are all these things in the Old Testament that are types of the Messiah to come. They're identifiable. So he might be walking along and he says, hey, you remember Eve and the serpent? Where the Eve, uh, the, the descendants of Eve are going to be hurt by the serpent, but you're going to crush his head. That's about the living word of God defeating Satan and sin. You remember Abraham's seed, a promise of blessing to be blessed? That's th that all th should come through the seed of Abraham to be blessed. That's about the living word of God. Sorry, we have sirens going on. I hope this house is not on fire, but this is a recording that we do live, right? You remember David's eternal throne? That's about the living word as king. You remember Boaz as the redeemer? 
That's about the king who's going to come, the living word who's going to redeem us from our sins. You remember the cities of refuge? Those are about the refuge you can find only in the Son of God, the, the um, living truth. You remember the sacrificial system, the Passover lamb specifically? That's about the sacrifice of the living word of God that he would make for our sins. You remember God's power over every enemy? Well, that power raised the living word from the dead. You remember the creative breath that, that created the world, breathed into man the, the breath of life? Well, that creative life is still alive in me, Jesus was not revealing yet, in the living word of God. It breathes new creation. You remember the gracious God, slow to anger, full of love? Well, it's that, that love that sent me, and, uh, the Son of God, into the world. I keep saying me. Jesus is not revealing yet. It, it sent the living Word of God into the world because He so loved the world. You remember God's justice for evil? That's what the living Word of God did on the cross. You remember the promise of life and place as the people of God? That's what the living Word came to do, to give us uh, inheritance eternally through resurrection. See, all of God's written word to Jesus is interpreted through the living word. And Jesus is the living word. Guys, what an incredible... I could, have, I could go on and on and on. I'm going to stop there because that's enough. Jesus understood that God's written word interpreted the living word, and that living word is him. But he just doesn't explain it, uh, some of the concepts and the typology. He actually fulfills it. Jesus, here's the next point, Jesus is the living truth as fulfillment of Scripture. In other words, there are things that were talked about in the Old Testament that would happen, that the Messiah would do, that the Christ would do, that um, Jesus would do if he was the real one sent from God. There are over 300 prophecies about Jesus in the Old Testament that um, needed to be fulfilled if it was the right person. And, and that's the count, over 300 prophecies um, were actually fulfilled in Jesus Christ in the life and the ministry and the death and the burial and resurrection of Jesus Christ. The Bible says in the Old Testament that this, this, that this king would be born of a, uh, as a descendant of Abraham and David, and of course Jesus was. The Bible says in the Old Testament that this person would be born of a virgin, born in the town of Bethlehem, and of course Jesus was. The, the Bible tells us, now again, that some of these writings are 1,500 years before Jesus was alive, that he would live in Egypt, that he would do ministry in Galilee, and of course that's where he did ministry in Capernaum, the, the people walking in darkness, Zebulun and Naphtali who've seen a great light, that's where he would do ministry. The Bible predicts that he would uh, cause the blind to see and the deaf to hear and the lame to walk, and he would cleanse lepers and he would raise the dead. He would preach freedom to people who are poor. This this is Jesus' first sermon in his hometown, actually quotes all these things that he would do miraculously. In Luke 4, remember, he's in his hometown, he's grown up, he's beginning his ministry at age 30, and he goes to synagogue like he always did because he was a godly man on top of it all. And they called on him to read the text. And there was a text in Isaiah that he was supposed to read. Most scholars believe, including my Jewish tour guide, Gadi, God bless you, Gadi, if you're watching, um, says that Jesus rolled it to the wrong reading of the day, and he came to Isaiah 61, 1 and 2, and it says, The Spirit of the Lord God is upon me, because the Lord has anointed me to bring good news to the poor. He has sent me to bind up the brokenhearted, to proclaim liberty to the captives, the opening of the prison to those who are bound, to proclaim the year of the Lord's favor, the day of vengeance of our God, to comfort all who mourn. And then the Bible tells us in Luke chapter 4 that he rolled up the scrolls, laid it on the um, the stone tablet uh, placed there where they kept them and sat down and the eyes of everybody were fixed on him because they knew it was a powerful Holy Spirit moment. And he says in that moment, today, the scripture is fulfilled in your eyes. In other words, Jesus at the beginning of his ministry said, I have come to be the Messiah. I'm going to do all these things, blind see, deaf hear, lame walk, cleanse the lepers. That's what's going to happen the Old Testament prophets also predicted the Messiah would come meek and mild, riding on a donkey into Jerusalem victorious with crowds cheering and worshiping him as a king. That happened. The Bible says in the Old Testament he'd be betrayed for 30 pieces of silver. That happened. That he would be beaten for our iniquities. He had stripes on his back for our sins. That happened. That he would be mocked. That he would hang on a tree. That happened. That while he's on this tree he would be thirsty and offer vinegar to drink and he would have people gambling over his clothes underneath him, that happened. That while he was on this tree, he would be pierced, but he would not have any of his bones broken. And then 
the Old Testament tells us he would be placed in a grave, but his body would not see decay. He would rise again on the third day. Can I just tell you the miraculous reality of Jesus fulfilling all of those things? Everything, the beginning with Moses and all the prophets, in verse 44, just across the page for most of you, uh, he says um, that he began to explain everything written about me in the law of Moses, the prophets, and the Psalms must be fulfilled. Jesus is the miraculous fulfillment that chance would not allow us to have. Some prophet, or some prophet, some uh, scientist back in the 1900s said that if Jesus just fulfilled eight prophecies, what would the odds of that be? That a man 1,500 years, separated 1,500 years from some of the writings, what are the odds that somebody could fulfill eight of those prophecies? Well, he calculated it would be one, uh, one in 10 to the 17th power. In other words, five commas and 17 zeros after the number one. One in that much of a chance. And he, he, he illustrated it this way. If you would take silver dollars uh, and you would cover the entire state of Texas to a depth of two feet, but you marked one of those silver dollars and you blindfolded someone at the top of the state of Texas and said, now you walk through the state of Texas, you can pick up any coin you want, but you have to pick up the coin that has the mark on it that indicates the one they've marked. He goes, that's the odds of Jesus fulfilling these prophecies. Do I believe that Jesus is alive, that he is the living word of God? I sure do. Why? Because he lives in me. I'll talk about that real briefly here in a minute. But I believe in Jesus Christ because he fulfilled all these scriptures, these ancient writings. And instead of revealing himself, Jesus just says, I want to teach you some stuff from the Bible. So now they're, he's finishing his Old Testament lesson, and you can probably see the city of Emmaus coming into sight. And, and they come to Cleopas' house, we assume. And Jesus acted as if he's just going to continue on his journey. Well, it's been nice talking to you guys. And, uh, and at that point, they're going, no way we're letting you go. They're so blown away by his teaching. They say, oh, please stay. And he's like, no, I, I've got a, a, another journey. He says, no, please, it's, it's evening. Stay and eat with us. Spend the night with us. And so they prepare a meal, and Jesus is still probably teaching, and they sit down to eat, and he takes the lead role. You know this. In the Jewish household, it was the, the leader's role of the household to take the bread and say the prayer of blessing over it, break it, and pass it out to people. And so Jesus took the bread and he blessed it, and he broke it, and then, look, their eyes were open, verse 31, and they recognized him. It was in this meal that we're going to celebrate in just a moment, where he took the bread and he blessed it and broke it, where they saw him. Jesus, the living truth, as proven by the Old Testament, as predicted by the Old Testament, has come and fulfilled all of that, including his death and his burial, should not the Christ suffer and enter into his glory, his death, burial, and resurrection. He's fulfilled all of those things, and he's actually sitting at the table with them, and then he vanishes. The next time we see him, he's with his apostles, probably in the same upper room where they celebrated Passover four nights earlier, and he's showing himself to them alive. And here's the question that I have for you today. Could we not say the same thing about our Lord and Savior as we've come to know him and followed him. Look what these guys say. Did not our hearts burn within us as he talked with us along the road? That's what they asked. When, when, they, when he was revealed, um, they knew that it was the Lord because something was happening in their heart as he exposed the scriptures. And that's the last thing there on your notes there. Jesus is still the living truth who's with us and in us. He still invites us to his table every week. And he still invites us to get into the scriptures and understand more fully who he is. See, here's what I believe. When you open the scriptures, your eyes are open to Jesus because the scriptures are about the living truth, Jesus Christ. It is a living and active sword. It is a live and abiding word that never fades. And it is all fulfilled in Jesus Christ. That's why we come today to the end of our time together and we share the body and blood of Jesus Christ. Grab your emblems, whatever you have around you at this time, and let's just remember what Jesus explained on the road to Emmaus, and now is true for us. Jesus is still the living truth, and he's still with us and in us. And part of our fellowship happens around the table, just like these guys on the road to Emmaus. We remember in the breaking of the bread that Jesus Christ is the living truth. Let's celebrate that together. And we remember in the sharing of the wine that Jesus' blood 
has washed away our sins. Now, Father, we thank you that you have been so gracious to love us. And um, we're blown away by this story. We worship you not as a dead uh, Christ, but as a living Christ who still lives in us by your spirit and with us as we fellowship with your people. Thank you, Father, for that great gift. It's in your son's name we pray. Amen. God bless you guys. See you next week.